Hello and welcome back to Anthropology 21 World Cultures. This is Lecture Series 5, Part 2. In this lecture, we will be discussing aspects of agricultural societies, and we will be looking at the Aztecs and the Mingakabo. So first, the focus of this lecture series is intensive agriculture. Now, intensive agriculture, also known as intensive cultivation, is large-scale farming. Intensive agriculture started around 5,000 years ago as human populations began to grow beyond the environment's carrying capacity. Now, intensive cult agriculture is characterized by the use of the plow, draft animals, or the machinery plow, and fertilizer and irrigation. So, cultivators who invested their time and energy in a piece of land developed the notion of property rights, and they have started to establish permanent settlements. Now, archaeologists debate that the first intensive agricultural societies were the ancient civilizations in Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, Pakistan, northern China, Mesoamerica, and Western South America. So over the last century, large-scale agriculture techniques spread rapidly throughout the world. So with this came the introduction of farm machinery, seed varieties, and commercially produced fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. And all of this eventually resulted in the industrialization of farming in the richer nations. Now, there is a price to pay for this subsistence strategy, however. Labor and capital. So, first, labor. Agriculturalists devote hours of hard work to prepare the land. They have to clear the land, they have to prep the soil, they have to dig irrigation trenches, drill wells, and, and then everything involved with growing the crops and harvest. So the second, capital. Now, intensive agriculture, also compared to, you know, as compared to horticulture, requires a much greater investment of capital. You have to you know, invest in plows, which must be maintained, mechanical pumps that can break. You know, you've got draft animals that can become sick and die. And then you get farm inputs such as fuel, fertilizer, seeds, and all of the stuff involved with that. All of which cost a great deal of money. Now, intensive agriculture is closely associated with both higher levels of productivity and more settled communities. In fact, not until early horticultural societies had developed more intensive forms of agriculture could civilization exist, that is, urban societies. So before we could develop such vast agricultural techniques, we, we didn't really get large cities. So surplus crops produced by farmers were sold in village markets. So some of these market centers increased in population over time and became towns and eventually cities. Now people were liberated to engage in activities other than food production. So now we start seeing new occupations emerge. We start seeing merchants and craftsmen uh, we start seeing professional soldiers, priests, rulers, and bureaucrats. So intensive agricultural production provided both the opportunity and the commodities and forever changed the course of history in many parts of the world. Now, during the Industrial Revolution, 
the agricultural process became industrialized as well. The industrialization in food production relies on technological sources of energy. So water and wind power were used in early stages, but today industrial agriculture utilizes motorized equipment such as tractors and combines. So farmers operating in industrialized societies uh, today have a wealth of new technology at their disposal to increase productivity. You know, we've got everything from GPS tracking combines and you know things to track systems and monitor yield from the crops and you know we the internet we use the internet to check out crop data so industrial agriculture requires complex systems of market exchange because of its highly specialized nature the high yields produced and the distance some crops travel before they are eaten or manufactured into something edible also play an impact with this type of society. So a recent consequence of this form of agribusiness, and that's what it is, it's business, is the demise of small-scale farms that use mainly family labor. You know, corporate farms have replaced farmers and uh, with wage workers, you know, and displaced farmers or immigrant farm workers who are paid low wages. So they keep new industrial farms working at optimum efficiency at the cost of the traditional values and systems. So while industrial agriculture has produced farms of enormous size and productivity, these changes have come at a high cost. For modern North Americans to have a wide variety of foods in their diets, which are frequently eaten out of season or year-round, um, additional expenses are incurred for the processing, the transporting, and the marketing of these foods. So the average food product purchased in the U.S. has to travel nearly 1,500 miles before it is consumed or taken home. Now, in, in addition to this, industrial agriculture has been responsible for considerable environmental destruction. Now, in more politically and technologically complex societies, agriculture comes to dominate production. In these societies, productive resources take many forms, including complex tools and the technological knowledge required to make them. So ownership of these critical resources may be limited to a small group whose members thereby gain power over the others and control their labor. So in some societies, productive resources are continually reinvested in order to generate profit for their owners beyond their subsistence needs, and such resources are referred to as capital. Although the use of capital occurs in many different sorts of societies, it becomes the principal form of economic organization in capitalist societies. Under conditions of intensive cultivation, the material and labor investment in land becomes substantial. However, large quantities of food are generated. Now, this food supports not only those who work the land, like we see with horticulture, but a large non-agricultural -agricult population as well. In many case cities, or in many cases, cities and towns develop. Now, under these circumstances, land becomes valuable and limited. So we start to see the individual ownership of land. Now, the individual land ownership may grow out of population pressures that produce land scarcity and lead to intensified methods of agriculture. 
Under these conditions, communal control of land creates conflict, as people begin to complain about not receiving their fair share. Now, just because an individual owns the land doesn't mean that they're the ones working the land. In societies with peasantries, landowners, rather than the cultivators, are able to claim most of the surplus. Land owners enjoy higher levels of consumption and standards of living, and land owners use the surpluses to command the service of craft workers, servants, and command armed forces. Therefore, agriculture tends to be associated with political organization characterized by a ruling landowner class with occupational specialization. Now, in wealthy nations, most people earn their livelihood by working for wages for businesses and other organizations that provide goods and services. These are usually organized as capitalist enterprises. Now, there are certain traits that we can assume or derive from agriculturalist economies based on their tendencies. First, resources are allocated according to the principle of private individual ownership. Secondly, most Westerners believe commonly held property will be destroyed or degraded because people will lack an individual incentive to maintain it. Okay, so for the next section, we are going to look more closely at the Aztec and Mungakobo cultures. Now, the people referred to as Aztecs call themselves Mexica arriving in central Mexico as nomads in the 13th century. They had risen to a position of political and military power by the time the Spanish arrived in 1519. With Tenochtitlan as their capital, uh, the capital of their empire, they had forged alliances with neighbors to the east and west. Now, Mexica migration into the Valley of Mexico began from Aztlan in the northwest some 200 years before their eventual arrival. As they marched south, they were met with great hardship. Expelled from each place, they attempted to settle. Throughout the Valley of Mexico, elaborate states were already flourishing. The people who had settled here and had developed complex specialized technologies including a sophisticated system of irrigation which afforded them a variety of crops in abundance. In addition, they possessed intricately organized social and economic systems. The nomadic Mexicas were not welcome in their attempt to seek out unsettled land. Now, their arduous trek was plagued with opposition from within and treachery from without. Evidence for internal rebellion is found in numerous accounts of their journey. Now, along their route, whenever they stopped, they constructed a temple for Huitzilopochtlia, the most revered of their deities, who provided guidance on their exodus. Among the ceremonies conducted at these sites were human sacrifices for which the Aztecs have come to be known. Many explanations have been offered for the various sacrificial occasions in Aztec culture. It has been suggested that the sacrifices performed en route to their permanent home may have served the purpose of eliminating opposition by members of the group who were agitating to remain where they were and not to continue on their journey as Huitzilopochtli decreed. 
Now, the response of the ruler of Calhoucan to the Mexica request for asylum exemplified the rejection they experienced from others. Their petition to settle in his kingdom was met with the granting of territory he knew to be infested with poisonous snakes. Now, he was sure this would put an end to those undesirable Mexicas. Instead, they roasted the snakes. They ate them and triumphed. Apparently, surprised at the Mexica tenacity and impressed by their military skills, those living in the area engaged the Mexicas as their mercenaries. Coupled with some of their more aggressive customs, these martial skills elicited both fear and hatred from surrounding peoples. When a ceremony to dedicate the king's daughter as goddess resulted in her death and flaying, the Mexica were forced once again to flee. Camping by the marshy shores of Lake Texcoco, they were instructed by Huitzilopochtli to look for the sign that would at long last indicate to them the site of their final destination. They saw this sign. There was an eagle resting atop a prickly pear cactus and knew they had reached the end of their difficult journey. They named the place Tenochtitlan, the place of the fruit of the pickly pear cactus. Now, this, the modern Mexican flag has at its center an eagle perched on the cactus with a snake in its talons. Now, the founding of Tenochtitlan in 1325 ended their wandering, but certainly not the struggle of the Mexica people. So, Tenochtitlan was connected to the mainland by three raised paved roadways. In the center of the city were eight or nine walled off ceremonial sites surrounded by the palaces and homes of nobility. Now, palaces were elaborate uh, edifices with several buildings and courtyards. Housed in the palaces were artists, crafts workers, servants, nobles, and government officials. And the structures included a courthouse, a warrior's council chamber, or war room, storage space for acquired tribute, and chambers for singers, dancers, and instruction of various kinds. Now, occupants and daily visitors to the palace numbered more than a thousand. Cities of this scope rely on material support. Central and southern Mexico was a place of environmental diversity, with intensive production and economic specialization resulting in a surplus of goods. The Valley of Mexico, heart of the Aztec Empire, was ideally suited to provide its inhabitants with resources for food, clothing, housing, and tools. Now, the Aztec Empire was built on agriculture, and at the core of this agriculture was maize. It formed the mainstay of the diet in various forms, and could be successfully grown in both the high plateaus and the tropical lowlands. Now, this success was largely climate dependent. Maize thrives best where rains are concentrated in the summer, and they are throughout Mesoamerica. Now, its centrality in subsistence earned maize a glorified position in Aztec culture. Now, hardly a mere foodstuff, it was intimately involved in Mexica daily life. People often personified maize, and addressed it with reverence as it was planted. 
There's poetry, hymns, sayings, and stories, all deified the crop and linked people metaphorically to it. Also, widely cultivated throughout the Aztec Empire, were beans, chiles, squash, maguey, and a host of other fruits and vegetables. Also, from cactus was produced alcohol. He also got fibers from it for clothing and medicinal remedies and sewing needles. Now, in the tropical lowlands, cotton and cacao were additionally cultivated. Cultivation was usually combined with the gathering of wild foods, hunting, and fishing. Medicinal herbs were of great value, as were peyote and mushrooms. Now, these, along with the fruits available predominantly in the lowlands, were in great demand at the marketplaces. Hunting held an esteemed place among the Mexicas as well. Dating back to their nomadic past, you know, this kind of tradition carried forward. In addition to providing food, fur, and skin, animals were hunted to supply the empire's zoos. Now, meat from land animals, such as armadillo, deer, rabbits, boars, and possums, was all part of the regular diet, and the animals were hunted with snares or bows and arrows. Now, the lakes in the area provided plentiful fish, reptiles, and crustaceans. Duck, quail, pheasant, and partridge were hunted by the lake shores and were valued as much for their feathers as for their flesh. The Mesoamerican food producing environment allowed both intensive and varied agriculture. This yielded two important consequences. First, it led to specialization in production. Those residing by the lake shore could devote themselves entirely to fish and waterfowl. Now, farmers in drier areas could specialize in products derived from cactus. And second, these specialized systems of food production resulted in enough of a surplus to allow many people to direct their talents to personal occupations other than agriculture. So we start seeing Ag occupational specialization. Now, in the urban centers of Mexico, craft manufacture was highly elaborated, with entire residential sections of town home to painters, goldsmiths, silversmiths, feather workers, and sculptors. Although their creations were held in high regard by the entire Aztec population, these products were only available to nobility, and consequently, the artists themselves enjoyed great prestige, and organized into exclusive guilds that had privileged relationships to the state. Now, feather workers appeared to have been especially esteemed, creating headdresses, fans, and costumes for nobility and the highest-ranking military personnel. The craft practiced most widely was weaving, an endeavor reserved only for women and pursued by women of all classes. Although every girl and woman learned to spin and weave cloth, the materials with which they worked and the garments that they produced varied greatly by the status of the weaver. Women in the lowest ranks produced simple goods for household use. Noble women, however, engaged in producing the elaborate ceremonial capes using the finest cotton, rabbit fur, and feathers. Now, clothing served the dual purpose of being both utilitarian 
and identifying the class of the wearer. Commoners were bound to wear garments made from only the coarsest fabrics. Nobility, on the other hand, had no apparel forbidden to them, but usually chose to exercise their privilege and wear the most elegant vestments. Now, within the highest class, more decorative clothing signaled greater wealth. Now, because of the vast range of occupational specialization, the marketplace was a central aspect of their society. Markets were the economic link between different regions of production, the political focus for gossip and information, and the social setting for most neighborhood interaction. The outdoor marketplace was the hub of every community, providing a meeting place for people of every age and social status to talk and share news as well as conduct business. Wares reflected the local environment in terms of items abundantly available. Now, larger markets trafficked additional in luxury items. Now, barter was typically the medium of exchange, but money in the form of cocoa beans and cotton cloaks was used. Less usual were bells, beads, and quills filled with gold dust. Now, textiles, which were bartered and sold in the marketplace, functioned as items of trade, religious offerings, marriage payments, decoration, and cremation cloths, among other uses. Trade was carried on by all members of the society, whether they were professional artisans or individual agriculturalists. Families routinely sold their surplus in public marketplaces. These small-scale producers were vendors in the marketplace and traded their wares to all passerby. Professional merchants were important on an entirely different scale. Their status afforded them political importance and also economic sway. The luxury items they produced were of paramount importance for the nobility to display as symbols of their status. Now, the next topic of Aztec culture that we're going to cover is their social organization. The Aztec Empire was a complex, stratified society with social organization guided by the principles of hierarchy and heterogeneity. Now, although one's position at birth, or your, your ascribed status, circumscribed the positions to which one could aspire, there was room for upward social mobility through accomplishments or achieved statuses. The most basic social distinction existed between the commoners and the nobility and these statuses were conferred at birth. Initially, membership in the nobility demanded that the ability uh, demanded the ability to trace one's ancestry back to the first Mexica ruler. However, the practice of polygyny and the fact that noble status was passed through both males and females led to an exceedingly high number of people who could lay claim on noble birth. So, in response to this, by the early 16th century, more stringent rules for reckoning legitimate noble descent were put into place. Now, rigid dress codes made status differences readily apparent. Commoners wore simple clothes, and their cloaks had to end above the knee. The nobility alone 
could wear headbands, feathers, gold armbands, and jewels in their lips, ears, and noses. Only the ruler and his second-in-command were allowed to wear sandals. Now, housing was also a status marker. Only those of noble rank could build two-story houses. So when visiting the palace, commoners knew which rooms were open to them and which were reserved for nobility. Separate courthouses were maintained for passing judgment on individuals of different classes. In these courthouses, nobility were judged more severely than commoners. For example, a commoner charged with public drunkenness was punished by having his head shaved, while a nobleman, being punished for the exact same crime, would be put to death. So, of course, the more far-reaching differences between the classes were economic and political. Ownership of land and access to public religious office and control over important resources were tied to social class as well. Now, the responsibility of all rulers included collecting tribute from commoners, organizing military expeditions, sponsoring religious feasts, and the ultimate adjudication of legal disputes that could not be settled by the courts. Now, despite the fact that this status was bestowed by birth, the personal qualities of the individual ruler often greatly influenced his ability to govern successfully. The ideal ruler was one who acted as a proctor and unifier one who assumed the burdens of leadership as well as its rewards. Now, although succession usually passed to brother or son, this was often contingent upon personal achievements. Now, chiefs formed the rank below rulers, and this status was usually granted to those who demonstrated superior military valor. Most chiefly duties involved military leadership, either advisory or on the battlefield, or service as a judge. Sons of nobility and who could expect to ascend to prestigious posts, even if they did not themselves become rulers or chiefs, were often the case. Now, the provincial nobility were largely concerned with agricultural and not urban issues, as might be expected. The administration of land and water rights was a greater import than military, manufacturing, or trade. The commoners made up the largest portion of the population. Now, they worked the the land, they filled the lowest ranks of the military, and paid tribute. They were not, however, a homogeneous group. For example, commoners had varying access to land. Some of the more well-off even had tenant farmers. Now, there were also serfs, or rural tenant farmers, and there were slaves in Mexico's social structure. Each of these classes of individuals was drawn from the stratum of commoners. People who were homeless, though economic need through warfare made up the majority of these ranks. Individuals also sold themselves or their family members into slavery to meet subsistence needs. Now, those unable to pay debts, tribute, or fines also ran the risk of succumbing to this fate. Now, this was, in almost all cases, an acquired status. So, children of serfs or slaves 
were born into freedom. Now, a bit more on Aztec life. The ideal attributes of a Mexica citizen were moderation and discretion in all pursuits. Men were expected to serve as providers and teachers, tending most studiously to the world outside the household. Women operated in the domain of the household, weaving, educating small children, and overseeing the efficient conduct of the family. Children were expected to show parents respect and obedience. Young children were expected to be dependent, and little was asked of them. By the age of five or six, greater expectations were placed on all children, both males and females. Instruction was aimed at instilling the virtues of honesty, obedience, and respect. Boys and girls were expected to be similar in their acquisition of these general characteristics. The practical skills to be developed and the chores assigned to each were different, however. Boys carried water and firewood. They brought goods to the market. They learned to fish or produce feather crafts. And girls, they learned to spin and weave. They learned to cook and to be proficient at housework. Now, formal education was compulsory for boys and girls, although girls generally attended for a shorter time. Now, beginning in early adolescence, formal teaching centered around songs, dances, and instrumental music. These were not only essential to ritual and religious participation, but their content also transmitted important historical le lessons and cultural values. So by age 15, boys attended schools whose curricula included history, calendrics, dream interpretation, and the skills necessary for various occupations, such as hunter or priest. Now, military instruction was the mainstay of commoner boys' formal education. So next up is their political organization. The Aztec Empire boasted an intricately structured military and government. The type of political organization that predominated from the 14th through the early 16th century was the city-state. Central Mexico was divided into some 50 or 60 of these units at this time, varying in size and political prowess. Now, the degree of autonomy enjoyed by rulers, or tlatoni, of the city-states was variable. The Tataloni functioned as a monarch. He was responsible for ritual, adjudication, waging war, and advocating for the rights of his citizens. In Tenochtitlan, the Mexica Tataloni was believed to be a descendant of the god Quetzalcoatl. Now, the rulers were earthly counterparts of celestial deities, and their rule was by divine right. Now, why the position of Tlatoni was an inherited one, often from brother to brother and then to the firstborn son of the oldest brother, a ruler had to have been proven valorous in battle before ascending to leadership. In addition to this godlike status, he must possess great personal skills, be an exceptional orator, and possess both exceptional understanding of the sacred and superior military prowess. The Tetloni embodied both great priest and 
great military captain. Now, the Council of Four, which are close relatives of the ruling Tlatoni, choose his successor. Once the new ruler is selected, a series of rituals are set into motion, culminating in the coronation. First, the new Tlatoni appeared before the priests, who escorted him, along with the council, to a public ceremony, where the citizens witnessed an offering of incense. The ruler and his council maintained a four-day fast, after which they returned to the temple and cut themselves, and offered blood to Huitzilopochtli. The custom after this initial offering was for any newly chosen Tlatoni to leave for the battlefield and return with prisoners. At the coronation, to which rulers from both allied and enemy lands are invited. There's a spectacular feast that is preceded by an expensive gift exchange, and the war prisoners captured by the new ruler were sacrificed. Now, this display served to strengthen allegiances and to warn enemies. It also served as a fair warning to any who would contemplate rebellion. Now, warfare has been called a cultural preoccupation of the Mexica people. It's woven into the fabric of social, political, economic, and religious life. Militaristic themes are abound. Now, a boy was declared a soldier at birth, and if his mother died in childbirth, she was glorified as a warrior and assured a blissful afterlife. Men were judged overwhelmingly by their militaristic skills and awarded commensurate with their valor. Now, victory in battle brought privileges in dress and ornamentation as well as gifts. These returns were thought to inspire continued military success. Now, death in battle brought great rewards in the afterlife. If warfare was not quite itself a religion, it was at least bound up with religion. Patron gods not only sent soldiers into battle, but also could only be appeased by human sacrifice gathered from enemy troops. Now, there were even particular enemies whom the gods were thought to find especially pleasing. Now, war, far from being the only means to expand territory, functioned as an end in itself. The conquest of new lands was a pursuit separate from the warfare engaged by the need to capture people to be offered as sacrifice, and to provide military experience for young soldiers. In fact, Aztec staged ritual wars, known as flower wars, for the way in which men fell to the ground like so many colorful blossoms shaken from a bow. Now, these were expressly for the purpose of gathering prisoners to be sacrificed. Now, while the topic of human sacrifice and cannibalism among the Aztec has generated much debate, there is no disagreement regarding the centrality of human sacrifice in their culture. The practice arose out of a debt owed to the gods. The consequence of not paying was no less than the end of the world. Now, Aztec myth describes that the creation of the sun and the moon and the inception of their movement. Now, when the current sun, which is actually the fifth sun of creation, was to be created, all the gods gathered at Tehokan to decide who will be willing to throw himself into a great fire and emerge as the sun. 
not two steps forward. One wealthy and arrogant, and the other was poor and humble. Now, as much as he wanted to be the son, the arrogant god lacked the courage to throw himself into the flames. Instead, the humble god cremated himself and rose into the sky as the sun. Now, furious at being outdone, the first god followed, only to emerge as the moon, a pale reflection of the sun's great light. Now, there they sat together in the sky. The gods knew that they must be separated. One must shine brightly in the day, and the other glow at night. So one god threw a rabbit at the moon. Some say to dim its light, others say to keep its distance from the sun. Now, even when this was done, the sun and the moon still hung, unmoving, in the sky. It was then that the other gods sacrificed themselves, for only their blood could put the moon and the sun in motion, and life for humankind was only possible with a moving sun, and this the gods provided. It then became the responsibility of humanity to feed the sun thereafter, lest it stop and the universe cease to with it. Now, although mythology states that sacrifice is to the sun, the wider notion is that there can be no life without sacrificial human death. So, the most common form of sacrifice was to open a man's chest with a sacred blade, tear out the still-beating heart, and offer it to the gods. Now, women occasionally had their heads severed before their hearts were removed. Children were most often drowned, securing good rainfall. And on special occasions and ceremonies dedicated uh, variations in the form of sacrifice, uh, although the removal of the heart and display of the head were constant. So priests, upon occasion, ceremoniously wore the skin of a flayed victim. All forms of sacrifice were sacred, performed without vengeance, and endured without regret. A captor honored and respected the person to be sacrificed. Those who died in this fashion were privileged to be the food of the gods, and in dying to keep the world alive, they were assured a sublime afterlife. So often, once the ritual was completed, the body was stewed and ritually consumed. Ritual cannibalism has been explained by some anthropologists as a religious phenomenon, while others propose it's an ecological explanation. Now, those who see cannibalism as an extension of religious motivation behind human sacrifice suggests that the sacrifice made the victims divine, and eating the divine made the consumer sacred. Thus, the belief that sacrifice is demanded by the gods and necessary for the survival makes eating the flesh of the sacrificial victim an extension of the ritual possess of maintaining the universe. Now, those who argue against such a supernatural stance suggests that there were nutritional reasons for the practice of cannibalism. Now, chief among them was the deficiency of protein and fat in the Aztec diet. Now, this was formulated by anthropologist Michael Hanar. Now, this theory proposes that cannibalism may have been couched in religious explanations but in fact alleviated a severe need for protein. If there was indeed a shortage of protein, feeding captives would only exacerbate the problem. Sacrifice obviated the need to provision a prisoner, and cannibalism provided protein. Now, this a 
assertion has been severely challenged on many grounds, including the fact that those who might be in greatest need of protein, commoners, children, and adolescents, were least likely to receive human flesh. Now, accessible, most typically, you know, was the nobles. Now, moreover, there is a debate as to whether protein deficiency existed in the first place. Now, population control is another motivation proposed for cannibalism, although this aim could hardly be best served by the sacrifice of adult males, which is the most usual offering. And instead, it would have been better to sacrifice women of childbearing age. Now, the Aztec worldview maintained that life was precarious, and it was the responsibility of humankind to attempt to control this uncertainty and assure their own continued existence. So, every half century, a dramatic ritual was undertaken. All fires were extinguished. All houses were slept clean, all hearthstones and cooking pots discarded. The entire population was awakened at night. Babies, if they slept, would be turned into mice. Now, they waited, and they poised to hear success in the ritual about to begin. So the ritual took place at the top of mountains in the dark. Now, priests would climb to the top of these mountains and sacrifice a victim, and attempt to kindle a fire in his open chest cavity. If the spark caught, and there was flame, life would continue for another half century. And then the citizens were notified of the new fire, and as they waited for the messages to bring them, flames to start their own fires, they would cut their ears and offer blood to the gods upon hearing the news. Now, should the fire not start, the sun would grow cold and the universe would end. So this ritual embodied the most salient tenets of Aztec culture, that the continuation of life is not ensured unless the people actively promote its survival through human sacrifice. So, Aztec rituals and ceremonies were very much tied up in their reckoning of time. They kept an annual ceremonial calendar based on the 365-day solar year, but also reckoned timed by a 260-day ritual calendar. This calendar contains the movable feasts, which are any religious festivals unfixed to the solar calendar, such that they may fall on a different date each year. The 260 and 365 day calendars have been conceptualized as two gears fitted side by side. When turning, the first days would align every 52 years. It is this alignment that gives rise to the half-century fire lighting ceremony mentioned earlier. Now, ceremonies occurred with great frequency. There were 18 regularly scheduled rituals each month. The vast majority of these had to do with petitioning the gods associated with fertility, rain, and agriculture. Now, many of these included fasting and offerings of some sort, from incense to human sacrifice, but they were always part of every ceremony. So that concludes the Aztecs. So next is the Mungakobo. Now, Sumatra is the largest of the great Sundas, and the world's sixth largest island. Towering along the length of its western coast is a massive wall 
of nearly 100 volcanic peaks, several of which are active. Now, made of two chains folded together, the tallest of the summits reach 12,000 feet. At the base of this mountain's eastern slope is a lush plain blanketed by dense tropical rainforest. In a valley between the two mountain folds rests a series of lakes. Now the equator slices the island and the climate is hot and humid. There is no dry season here and 145 inches of rain falls annually. Now Sumatran wildlife includes elephants, tapirs, leopards, tigers, rhinoceroses, proboscis monkeys, and orangutans. The east coast is swampy, the south sparsely populated but wealthy with oil fields. Now, the north boasts waterfalls and tropical jungle. Now, West Sumatra is home to the Mangakabo, in the center of the island. Along with the western coast facing the Indian Ocean live the four million Mangakabo. Now, Sumatra's contact with Europe began as early as the 13th century with Marco Polo's expeditions to the northern part of the island. The riches to be had far outweighed the extreme hardships of travel to the Indies, and there was fierce competition for spices, gold, and textiles. Now, the Portuguese were the earliest Europeans to dominate trade in Indonesia. By the early 16th century, they controlled the ports. After the Portuguese, both the British and Dutch arrived in Indonesia in search of spice trade. Now, early in the 17th century, that is when the British and Dutch arrived. The British established trade relations on the west coast of Sumatra, engaging in near constant conflict with the Dutch, to whom they eventually traded West Sumatra possessions for the port of Malakia on the Malay Peninsula to the north. While British, Portuguese, and Spanish traders all were present in Indonesia waters, it was the Dutch who eventually held sway. At the beginning of the 19th century, a group of Dutch traders formed the Netherlands East India Company in an attempt to monopolize Indonesian trade and force their Portuguese and British rivals from the area. Now, they encountered formidable competitors in the Chinese, Indian, Arab, and Asian merchants, but they persevered. And by the end of the century, they had gained control through a combination of industry and arms. The Netherlands East India Company negotiated directly with the Mingakabo. Now, contracting with the royal family for exclusive rights to the pepper and gold trade on the western coast. At the turn of the century, the company declined into bankruptcy, and by the 1800s, the Dutch government took over their land, exerting control mainly on Java. There, the Dutch instituted a system wherein export crops were to be delivered to the Dutch. West Sumatra was one of the areas outside of Java where this tribute was also demanded, and the Mingakabo high, highlands provided coffee to profit the Dutch government. Now, with the proviso that they could not sell coffee on the open market. So, by the late 19th century, there was growing Indonesian resistance to Dutch rule. Among the Bengakabo, as coffee production began to decrease, the Dutch imposed instead a monetary tax. 
Now, while this freed the Mangakubo to sell their coffee at higher prices, it ran counter to an early promise by the Dutch never to levy direct taxation on the Mangakubo. So, over the next several decades, the new country experienced devastating social and economic troubles. And it wasn't until 2004 when Susilio Babag Yudoganado became Indonesia's first directly elected president. Now, the Mangakabo account for nearly 90% of West Sumatra's population of roughly 5 million. The Mangakabo referred to their home as Alam Mangakabo. The Mangakabo world is what that means. Alam Mangakabo is divided into two regions, Darat and Rantau. These are geographic designations, but also cultural phenomena. While Darat refers specifically to the highland home of the Mangakabo, it also refers to the cultural core of home. Now, Rantau is the term applied to outlying districts and figures prominently into Mangakabo social and economic life. So the Durat is further divided into three districts, or Luke's. Tanadatar, Agam, and Lima Pula Kota. Within these three core districts, are the village communities or Nagari. Now, Nagari are larger than many traditional villages and thus are sometimes referred to as village republics. The largest may be home to several thousand. Now, each Nagari has at least one mosque and one council hall, the ballet in which the governing council sits. So, the first Mangakabo Nagari, according to Tambo, which is Mangakabo historical legend, was Paranang Padang Panjang. It was the first Nagari that the four Matra clans, or Suku, originated. So, out of these ancestral clans, which were Koto, Pailang, Bodhi, and Kanago grew all of the Mangakabo people. Now, who left? They all left the original Nagari to settle others as their numbers grew. And it was in this way that the entire Alam Mangakabo came into being. Although there are now many clans, it has been established that every Nagari contains at least four, in keeping with the original number of Suku. Each Suku is further divided into six lineages, or Kams, each with a clan leader, or Penghulu. The Kwam is a social unit of individuals descended from a common ancestor, and it both possesses communal property and bears communal social responsibility for the actions of its members. Kwam members live together in a neighbor in a neighborhood, or Kampuang, which shares rights to the land and they bear social obligations to one another, both ceremonial and mundane. So individuals have rights and obligations at each level of social organization. They are loyal to their Kwam in dealings with other Kwams. They also defend their Suku to other Sukus and stand by their Nagari in relations to other Nagari. 
Now, at the heart of Mangakubo social structure is a dot. In fact, any discussion of traditional Mangakubo life must begin with a dot. So, the concept of a dot is of crucial importance to Mangakubo life, past and present. It is a term that is most often translated as customary law. The traditional rules of conduct, belief, and social organization. It is what is right and proper. It is what essentially is Mangakubo. Now, a dot's been described as a unitary, all-embracing concept encompassing an expansive set of institutions governing the conduct of all personnel, kin, and local affairs. In addition, it includes the reciprocally based relationships between humans and the natural and supernatural realms. So, the pervasive and solid reality of the power of a dot is captured in the well-known saying that claims that the living are anchored and guided by in their lives by a dot in the same way that the dead are surrounded and held firm by the packed earth of their graves. So, it was at the inception of the Alam Mangakabo that a dot was established. The Tambo recounts the beginnings of Mangakabo history, the time before memory, in which the rules of a dot were given and the royal family was established. Taufik Abdullah, a scholar of Mangakabo history, explains that the Tambo provides both mystical sanction to the existing order and categories for the perception of reality. It is not only a recounting of history of the Mangakaba world, but also a template with which events in modern times may be interpreted. So Tambo legend has it that two men, they took Katu Mong Gong Gron and they took Preptia Nan Sabatang confided a dot. They also divided d the Durat into Nagari, Suku, and their Panghulu. They also established the rules for governance. Now, being half brothers and descendants of the King Maharaja Diraja, Katu Mang Gong Gron was of pure royal blood, but Pereptiha, Nan Sabatang's father, was a commoner. Thus, each developed a political duration derived out of his own birth. The followers of Katu Mangangan created a system of aristocracy, and those of Pereptiha, Nan Sabatang, the commons system. Now, the brothers divided the three Luaks into these two systems, or Laras. So, the settlements which followed the Adat Katu Mangwangan are in keeping with his aristocratic heritage, and its, in, its adherents have a hierarchical lineage system, with some Panghulu of higher status. So, they built their village council halls to represent this authority structure. The ends of the building were raised above the middle section, with the Panghulu of higher rank sitting above the others. Now, those adherents of Adat Pereptiha Nan Sabatang followed a system that is more democratic in form. So, the Panghulu lineage chiefs who make up the village council are regarded as having equal stature. So unlike the seating in the previous system, in the council houses, here it is said the Panghulu, when they sit, they are equally low, and when they stand, they are equally high. 
In addition to these two systems, some Nagari choose a mixture of the two, with the villages home to some clans that follow one set and some clans that follow the other set. Now, traditional Mungakubo Adat encompasses four district or distinct categories, which speak to different levels of society and institutions, and which differentially guide belief, behavior, and choices. They are Adat, Nan, Sabana, Adat. Adat, Nan, Tarat Adat. Adat, Nan, Diadat, Khan. And Adat, Ice, Adat. Now, the first Adat category, which is Adat, Nan, Sabana, Adat, refers to the immutable laws of nature. These are represented by general natural laws. The nature of water is to be wet. The nature of fire is to burn. The nature of that which is sharp is to wound. So, the physical world is that within which the social world must operate. It is therefore of primary importance that this be understood. They are the most fundamental adat, the real self-evident adat where no human intervention can change its course. The second category, adat non tara adat, is the essence of Mangakabo social organization. These are all of the principles set out at the beginning of the world. The rules constituting the Nagari, Luak, Suku, and Penghulu are all in this category, as is the principle of matrilineity, which we will see as fundamental to the Alam Mangakubo. So, the survival of Mangakubo life and the continuity of its traditions are ensured by the adherence to this adat. Now the third category, adat non diadat khan, is best rendered as local adat, while adat non tara adat is focused on the maintenance of tradition, it is this adat that allows for the change over time. Its tenets are based on decisions made by deliberation by village council, which has wisdom to recognize the rigidity in the face of new situations is dysfunctional. So consensus is the guiding principle in considering change in local rules, which is proposed to all, and adopted if there is unanimous approval. Now, the last are the Adat Aistiadat, which is the daily customs and practices, the social behaviors that are considered appropriate but not obligatory. So the rules of Adat then are the customs and guiding principles that govern all the realms of human experience, physical or social or spiritual. So above and beyond the specific rules are two overarching principles, consensual agreement and cooperative group effort. So all members of Alam Mangakubo have the ob obligation to all others and to achieve the aims of a unified world. So challenges must be approached with an eye to compromise and unity. So, next we're going to talk about the rise of Islam in this society. So, most sources cite reasons of expanding trade for the initial introduction and eventual spread of Islam through Malaysia and Indonesia. As early as the 7th century, Muslim traders had brought Islam to the islands. 
Now, by the time of the Crusades, last or late in the 11th century, Southeast Asia was well linked by trading and shipping to the Far East, Asia, and the Mediterranean. Now, while there is evidence for small Islamic settlements by the end of the 13th century, it was not until the 14th and 15th centuries that Islam predominated. In the early 15th century, Malacca, which was a port in southwestern coast of Malay Peninsula, controlled the Strait of Malacca, which was a crucial trade route between Malaya and Sumatra. Now, as, Islam, as Islamic rulers settled there, Malacca soon became a Muslim state, and the northern Sumatra followed. It was the local rulers who converted to Islam first, with their subjects to follow. So both politics and economics were at work. Now, it was suggested that Muslim merchants were more likely to choose one port over another for their trade if the ruler was Islamic, and not Hindu. So moreover, as Europeans competed both for trade and religious converts to Christianity, local rulers embracing Islam could find wider Muslim support against European encroachment, especially against the Portuguese. The Aka, who live on the northernmost tip of Sumatra, were most likely the earliest Sumatran converts to Islam. However, the Mangakabo have long been a source of interest in discussions of Islamic dominance in Indonesia, for both historical and ideological reasons. Historically, because the Bloody Padri, Wars, and ideologically, owing to the coexistence of belief systems that would seem unlikely to blend easily together, the matrilineal adat and the patrofocused of Islam. So, the Mingakabo are perhaps best known for two features of their society. The rule of matrilineal descent and the male practice of Mirantau, or out-migration. Now, these two are interrelated. So, matrilineal descent has long been intriguing to ethnographers. In the 19th century, evolutionary views held that matriline was the initial form of social organization and as such was destined to evolve into more advanced patriarchal system. So over the past 50 years or so, arguments about theories of, of descent have waxed and waned with debates circling around issues such as instability of matrilineal systems, the conflict between authoritative and reproductive roles, and strains between allegiances to different lineages and imbalances in power and gender relations. And they all pointed toward the eventual demise of matrilineity. Now, it is often the Mangakabo who are mentioned in such discussions, perhaps because matrilineity has survived, despite social and economic change. And the Mangakabo remain the largest and most stable matrilineal society in the world today. So, in matrilineal systems, individuals belong to the family group of their mother. Women retain membership in their own groups after marriage and generally continue to live amongst their matrikin, practicing matrilocality. So, in Mingakabo society, the most basic genealogical unit is the Samande, one mother. A mother and her children, the Samande. The core belief of matrilineity is that this mother, this mother-child bond, is the most basic to society. So Mingakabo's social structure 
as we have seen, is guided by a dot law, which sets forth the rules for matrilinity regarding village organization, group membership, residence, and in the inheritance of property. Now, as is the case in most matrilineal systems, a man is differentially responsible to his children who are not part of his family and to his sister's children who are. Now, the Mangakabo have a Mamak Kamen Nakan, which is a uncle, niece, or nephew network. Now, the Mamak generally is the oldest male member of the Suku and is head of the family and is responsible for the welfare of his sister's children. He represents the family in Suku affairs. However, despite the fact that they are not members of the same clan, fathers have a close, important relationship with their children. Now, the distinction between a man's role as father versus that as uncle is perhaps best expressed by the adage that he holds his children in his lap but guides his nieces and nephews with his right hand. The earliest writings on Mangakabo residents reported that marriage was something of a visiting arrangement. A man visited his wife at night, but in the morning returned to the home of his mother and sisters. However, more recently, it's been noted that he has been deemed useful to think of residents as being made up of several aspects. So, domestic residents has eating, sleeping, child rearing, has always been extra local in the wife's home. Now, political residents, defined as a place where an individual enacts rights and duties as a community member, is matrilocal at the site of the matrilineage. So, economic residence is the site of labor and other productive activities. So for men, these used to be almost exclusively located at the matrilineal home. Now, men tend to work near their wives and their children as well. So, let's talk about the, the Marin Natal. The Alam Mangakabo is divided into Durat, which is home, and Rantau, the lands beyond. Perhaps one of the most distinctive features of Mangokabo social life is the practice of Marantau, or voluntary out-migration. Marantau, taken literally, means to go to the Rantau, the outlying territories of the Alam Mangokabo. Now, it has been suggested that the more modern practice of Marantau has its roots in the earlier, less formal practice of village segmentation. So, Mangakabao were originally sedentary agriculturalists, and their land in the Durat, which was rich and productive, and resulted in bountiful rice harvest. So, in response to the rapid population growth, lineages and sublineages left their original Nagari and set off to establish new ones. Their intent was to stay in the newly settled village. In addition to agriculturalists establishing new Nagari, Mangakabo traders also ventured into the Rantau with gold and other goods. It's been pointed out that this was only practical. Outsiders rarely visited the inland home because the Durat was difficult land to traverse. Thus, it became necessary for the merchants to take their goods to the Rantau. So, a husband is, in essence, a guest in his wife's ancestral home. 
So during the time he is there for meals or to visit his children, he has restrictions placed on his behavior and has no domestic power to speak of. In his own home, that is the ancestral home of his mother and sisters, he is in the position of mamak, with rights and obligations pertaining to his sister's children. However, he does not own the ancestral property he manages there. Because the husband is burdened with obligations to two households, but only partly belongs in each, it has been concluded that rather than continue to float between them, his feelings of discomfort and restlessness propel him to go Marintau. There, he can work unburdened by the marginality and daily conflicts engendered by his dual role as father and or as husband and mamak. So, by the middle of the 19th century, Marental was no longer solely the permanent institution of new settlements. It was an institutionalized flow of merchants, artisans, students, clerks, government officials, political activists, professionals, and religious teachers. So, Let's talk about the Mangakabo Economic Organization. A combination of wet rice cultivation and agriculture in dry fields has been the mainstay of Mangakabo economics for hundreds of years. The plains areas are ideal for the wet rice fields, which rice is usually locally for subsistence and sold in the uplands. Now, surrounding these are the volcanic highlands, whose land is better suited to crops grown by dry agriculture, as well as coffee, which thrives in many hill villages and is much sought after commodity around the world. So, most Mangakabo are still farmers living in ancestral Nagari. So, in addition to rice, Villagers grow a variety of fruit and vegetable crops in their irrigated fields, such as peanuts, peppers, maize, and tomatoes. Now, local markets, which often move around from Nagari to Nagari, sell not only produce, but also fish and meat, clothes and jewelry, and other items such as books, textiles, and other items. So. Merchants from various communities follow the market as it travels. And different Nagari boast skilled artisans whose works are sold both locally and in larger cities. So jewelry, woven purses, silver and other metallurgy, weaving, bamboo carving, and pottery number among them. In addition, commodities such as rubber, tea, spices, and especially coffee are sold on the worldwide market. In turn, manufactured goods from abroad find their way into the village markets. So there is no Nagari in West Sumatra today that does not participate in the global economy. So, the traditional Mangakabo house is the Ruma Gadong, a large structure housing a matrilineage of up to four generations. It is built above ground and with the traditional sloping roof resembling buffalo horns. It has, at its center, a long inner room. Now, this serves as a communal living space as well as a ceremonial area for marriages or clan business. The kitchen is off at one end, and there is often a long porch running the length of the front of the structure. Each of the adult women who form the residential core of the household has his or her own room, or billet. Surrounding this central chamber, where she receives her husband at night when he comes for 
from his own mother's Romangadang. This communal lineage house serves as the symbol of the matriline, and the senior women are sometimes spoken of as central pillars of the house. Young children eat and sleep in their matrilineal Ramad Gadong, playing outside during the day and accompanying mothers and their aunts at their work. So, by the time they are six or seven, they are ready to begin formal Islamic schooling in the Nagari's prayer house, or Surau. So, boys sleep in the Surau until they are married, in which case they begin to sleep at their wife's billock, or they go off on Marantau. Now, girls sleep at home in the Ramagadong. So, the ownership and inheritance of Mangakabo property is governed by a dot. Property consists of Harato Pusakao, which is ancestral property, and Harto Pansiran, which is acquired by an individual or couple. So, Harto Pusako encompasses the rice fields, the ancestral home, and all other property owned by the lineage. Now, these two types of property are governed by different rules. Harto Pensarian, which is, you know, acquired goods, are inherited by either sons or daughters, and our mandates are more flexible. So sometimes acquired property is passed by mothers to daughters and by fathers to their sons, a system found not uncommonly in Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, should the owner wish, Harto Pensaran may be sold. Now, Harto Pusako, which is ancestral property, however, you know, has much more stringent rules attached. It is always the possession of women, and it's passed from mother to daughter and never, ever sold. So, rights to ancestral land are passed along from senior women to their adult daughters, with each receiving an equal share. Such ownership contributes to women's socioeconomic autonomy. Even when land is parceled out for this inheritance, however, it remains ancestral land, the property of the matrilineage. Now, this land, a dot, is very strong. Although there are allowances made for unusual circumstances, you know, such as no direct female descendants or uh, financial need that may result in the, you know, quote unquote, pawning of the land. Uh, this happens, but it is very much frowned upon. Now, it is through their wives that most men have access to land. By farming it and eating what they grow. So, however, some men will receive gifts of some proportion of the land's yield from their sisters or nieces in recognition of their special bond. So, if a man falls on hard times, his sisters may allow him to use some ancestral land. Which brings us to our last topic of the Mangakabo, and that is the socio-political organization. Each matrilineal segment is headed by the lineage chief, the Penkulu. Although these groupings are matrilineal, they have male leaders. A dot law mandates that the Penkulu's power extend across all important categories, be it political, economic, social, and ceremonial. So, conflict resolution is always attempted at the lowest level of social organization, you know, so the household, or the sublineage, or the lineage, or the laras. Now, each of them have their own Penghulu leader, and the ideal of unanimous consensus is paramount. So, the Penghulu have three associates, each of whom, each of whom 
is responsible for a different sphere. One assists in resolving disputes. The second watches over security in the Nagari. And the third advises the Panghulu in matters of Islamic law. Panghulu council meetings are held in the Balay Adat, or council hall, with proceedings run according to the Adat that prevails, whether it be the Adat Koto Palang or the Adat Bodhi Kanango. Well, that concludes Lecture Series 5. Next time, for Lecture Series 6, we are going to look at how everything we have been looking at over the past semester is used and applied as a profession. So Lecture Series 6's topic will be Applied Anthropology. And as always, let's all try and make better mistakes tomorrow.